I'm an Android engineer at uh, BlaBlaCar, uh, and today we, I'm going to present you our experience migrating one, one of our apps from uh, AutoValue to Kotlin data classes. Um, before we get into the migration process itself, the, let's just take a quick look into what is AutoValue and wh we, why we decided to use it uh, to begin with. So here is a simple harmless user class, and we can typically call it a value or content class because we're interested in its contents. And if that is the case, there's a number of things we can do with this class to make sure we use it properly in Java. For example, we can uh, make sure that the class is annotated to the final and its fields are final as well, so we ensure that uh, the contents are immutable. If we do that, we need to make sure we have a constructor to construct our class. Okay, this is what we Sorry. Okay. Um, so we need to have a constructor to ensure that our class can be accessed properly. We might also be interested in uh, annotating fields that are nullable with a nullable annotation. Um, since we're interested in the contents, uh, we may as well, we, we, we should also add, uh, uh, override uh, equals and hash code. Uh, if you're using Android Studio or IntelliJ or most uh, modern IDs, uh, the IDs can uh, generate this code for us, but we still need to manually go into the function that generates this code and add it uh, to our user class. Um, again, if you're using, if you're using Parcelable on Android and we want to, to have our user class implemented, we need to add the implementation for Parcelable. We need to expose the right getters for the content that we want to access. If we want to change some of the contents, we probably want to add some kind of function like this to copy the contents to a new instance of our user class, and so on and so forth. And in the end, what we get is this uh, huge class with a lot of boilerplate code just to make sure that the contents of our, of our class um, is uh, proper, properly handled. And um, that's not all, so there's a lot of things that I didn't uh, add to that code, so if we want, we could an also annotate the non-null uh, fields. I didn't, we didn't add the tree string implementation to that class. Uh, if we remove or if we add a field, we need to ensure the consist consistency of the implementations of hash code, of equals, and so on. If we are doing serialization with this class, we need either to write our own custom adapter or rely on reflection and repeat this for every new class that uh, we want to behave the same way. Um, what is the solution? So one of them is AutoValue. And AutoValue is a library by Google uh, which basically addresses all of these issues. And it uh, automatically generates these uh, boilerplate code for us. So it can generate equals, hash code, true string, and so on. And it has a powerful plugin system that we can add other dependencies um, to make sure that these other kinds of boilerplate code that we need on Android is also generated for us. Uh, why use it? So this is from, why this? Sorry. Okay, I think now it's good. <laughs> so why use AutoValue? Uh, this is taken from their GitHub page, so these are the reasons that they explain. And they, if you follow that link later, they have also a presentation where they explain more details about the advantages of auto value over, over different solutions. Basically, there are no runtime dependencies. Every time is generated at uh, compile time. Uh, the API is invisible. The class that is going to be generated functions like any other in your project. There is very little cost to performance since everything is done at uh, compile time. Your class is like mostly like any other, so there's very few things you cannot do with it. There's then very little magic uh, that is happening behind the scenes. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, well, basically, you annotate your auto value, uh, your class with auto value. I really don't know why this is. <laughs> Um, so you, you have a, like, you, what you have to do is have an abstract class uh, that you annotate with auto value, and the fields now become abstract methods. And so our previous uh, class that we had fields for the values that we're interested in, now they're abstract fields, and the ones that are nullable we annotate as such. And behind the scenes, what auto value is doing is 
generating this code for us. So this is not us writing this anymore. So all the node checks, all the hash code, all the equal implementation and so on is generated by auto value. So it takes that burden from us and it's done automatically uh, through an annotation processor. Um, but now, since this is an abstract class, we need to somehow expose a way to get an instance of this, uh, of this class. And we do this with a static method. Typically, you can also use a builder pattern if you want. So AutoValue provides that for you as well. Uh, here, to simplify, we have a simple uh, create static method that then in, in behind the scenes, we are returning an instance of this AutoValue underscore user that AutoValue created for us. Um, in addition, there are these plugins that I mentioned before. So AutoValue has this powerful plugin system that you can basically um, add more things to generate code for you for your class. In our project, we use these three. So with AutoValue with, AutoValue JSON for serialization, and AutoValue Parcel for the parcelable implementation. And with these plugins in place, all you have to do is add the, the, the header of the things you're interested in. So for parcelable, you just have to say that your class now implements parcelable. Um, for the transformations that you want to change uh, some fields, you can annotate them with this with uh, method. And for serialization, you have to add this uh, static type adapter function that returns the type adapter that was uh, generated for you by the plugin. Uh, what AutoValue is doing now is creating these uh, four different classes. So these are all extending from one another. So if you look behind the scenes what AutoValue is doing, so there is one first class with the $3 that extends from our original user abstract class. And this is the original AutoValue generated code. Then you have another one that extends from the previous that has the JSON type adapter inside that was also generated by the plugin. Uh, a third one which is for the width transformation that we have. And finally, the last one which handles the parcelable implementation on Android. So this is all now generated for us and we don't need to, to bother with creating this code anymore. So we just have this uh, abstract class with the content that we're interested in. There's very few extra annotations that we need to add to our class and we get all these uh, code generated for us for free. And if we have that, why migrate to data classes then? Uh, in principle, since we have this class now in Java and if we are migrating our project to Kotlin, we could just have auto value in Kotlin. Um, the reason we migrate to data classes is because, well, they are a native uh, answer to, to value classes. So data classes already out of the box give us pretty much everything that auto value does as an external dependency. So if you're using Kotlin, data classes generate equals hash code and tree string for you at compile time. So you're not doing an annotation processing step anymore. This is done during compilation of your Kotlin class. And you get extra stuff. For example, copy replaces our uh, with function that we had. And it's more powerful because it's much more flexible in what kinds of contents you can modify. And you also get the structuring declarations, which is this way of uh, uh, assign your object into different variables straight away, which is quite useful, for example, if you're chaining Rx uh, operators or in Lambda declarations in general. Um, so what we get is, comparing the two, is that with data classes, we have less external dependencies. The code is much simpler, much smaller. It's just one line of code instead of all these fields and this abstract class that we have. We don't need an abstract class anymore, so we get our final class. Uh, we don't have an annotation processing uh, step happening because uh, this is done uh, by Kotlin at compile time. And we had a few smaller plugin issues as well that we don't get anymore with uh, Kotlin data classes. So with the plugin, just briefly, uh, well, there are yet other dependencies in our code. So they are not provided by Google. They're not part of AutoValue itself. So they are the other libraries by other developers that uh, if we're using them, there are other dependencies that we need to make sure we keep up to date. Uh, the width. For every little configuration that we have for the data we want to change in our classes, you need to provide a new method for it. That's how the plugin works. So if you have many transformations, that can become quite an extensive list of with functions in our class. And in case of JSON, in our project we use JSON. You cannot use the field name policy. You need to annotate all your 
camel case uh, fields with the snake case version if that's what your API is uh, returning. So in other words, what we're doing is moving from this, which is the auto value class in Kotlin, so to this, which is a much smaller, concise version and simple that gives us pretty much everything that auto value gave in Java. This is not to say that auto value is not good. By all means, it's very good if you're using Java. Just that if you're moving to Kotlin, data classes offer a much better way to achieve the same result. Um, two things to say here. First, we are using a parcelized plugin, which is uh, Kotlin's answer to parsable implementation. What is different here in this plugin is that this is a compiler plugin. So again, there is no annotation processing happening here. And you can see this you know, on Android Studio. You can go to uh, Tools option and show the Kotlin bytecode. And if you press the decompile button, you get this, which is our data class decompiled into Java. And you can see uh, everything that we had in our auto value generated class. So all the no checks, all the equals hash code, and so on, and the parcelable implementation. And this was done at compile time by the parcelized plugin. Um, another thing to say here is that we are using, we are using JSON. And JSON doesn't have Kotlin support. And so if we just have this class as it is shown here, and we are trying to parse the content from a JSON response, um, what happens, for example, if login is not present? JSON doesn't know about non-optional and optional fields in, uh, in Kotlin. So what it's going to do is assign null to this login field anyway, even though in Kotlin this is not an expected behavior. So what happens is that the program is going to fail later. It's still going to parse. It's still going to work as a parsing uh, result. But once, once you need to use that field later in your code and you don't know exactly where, uh, this will fail in some unexpected ways that it's only, you're only going to notice later or you might not even notice independently on how your code uh, works or which kinds of fields are having no values assigned to them. Um, which leads us to our next um, step, which is, so how do we handle serialization? Well, we were using JSON before, which is a classic, and it worked well for us until now. Um, there is Moshi as an alternative, which is faster than JSON, doesn't have many of its quirks. Uh, it's a smaller library as well, so in general it has advantages over JSON. And more recently, I don't know how many of you attended the talk before lunch where this was uh, shown as well, uh, that more recently, the new version of Mushi also has a code generation for creating the adapter uh, at uh, annotation processing time. So you don't need to rely on Kotlin reflection, which is quite a big library. Um, and so Moshi comes with Kotlin support out of, out of the box. Well, for us, we had JSON all over the place in our code there was an alternative. So there is an extension from uh, this author, which is a, a library called JSON value that works on top of JSON and generates the adapters for us. Moshi has a similar solution if you're looking at, uh, at uh, an alternative from what uh, Moshi provides, which is called Kochi, and they both work similarly. So JSON value, all you have to do is annotate your class uh, with uh, the JSON constructor. And if you have any snake case to camel case uh, conversion to do, you can do so with serialized name. Uh, Kochi works uh, similarly, so you annotate it uh, with uh, JSON serializable and uh, the camel case uh, or the custom names that you want to change from the response, you also can set up this way. However, there is a third option that we looked into which is uh, newer and is also provided by Kotlin, which is Kotlin X serialization, or we're going to refer to it as K serializer here. And K serializer, uh, in principle, works similar as, similarly as the other two solutions. So you basically annotate it with serializable on the constructor and custom fields with serial name. Um, but two things make them make uh, Kotlin X serializer. Uh, more interesting. First, this is a compiler plugin. It's not an annotation. It, there is no annotation processing step here. So this is the compiled, uh, our compiled uh, user class. And you can see that uh, uh, the serializer annotation added this uh, serializer field to our class at compile time. Um, 
And the second thing that is interesting is that this is multi-platform. So if we look quickly at the source code of uh, the case serializer, we have this at the common, we have this interface at the common level, which is independent of platform, uh, which is this interface expecting a serializer uh, in, our, in our class. And note the expect keyword here by Kotlin, which is uh, it's a way to tell uh, the compiler that we need to have a platform-specific implementation. And if you look at the GVM part of the source code, so we, act, we have the actual implementation of this function that returns the serializer that was compiled in our object for us. And you can see an example of this uh, in this app by Jake Wharton. That is an example of Kotlin mode platform uh, that does uh, search on the Android SDK, uh, both on Android and as a Chrome uh, extension, I think, I believe. And it uses Kotlin serialization as well as coroutines and Kotlin mode platform. So it's an interesting example to look at. All right. Um, so we looked at these three. There are others, but these two were the more likely candidates to transition from uh, JSON in our case. Um, they all had issues with uh, the field name, so we can't have a general field name um, policy assigned to our classes, so we need to use this. Um, uh, serialized name, this custom transformation for fields that uh, use camel case in our project. And ultimately, case serializer looks very appealing. It's multi-platform, doesn't rely on reflection, it's a compiler plugin, has uh, more flexible adapters. And when we first looked at it, was it faster? We, we, we wondered. And when we first benchmarked this in February, turns out it was not, by a lot. Um, we, we build on top of this work by uh, Zach Sewers, sorry if I'm pronouncing his name uh, wrong, uh, where he benchmarked uh, other solutions but not the case serializer. So we added to it, and it turns out at the time it was three times as slow in some cases. So our solution at the time was to use reflection plus JSON value where it made sense to use it. Uh, since we control our API, we knew where we could uh, rely on, uh, on reflection from JSON. Um, today, however, looking at this again, so we ran the same uh, benchmarks again, and uh, we can see that the folks at uh, Kotlin did a lot of work to improve the performance, and they're basically just as fast now. So there's, there's basically no much of a difference between them. And if you look at auto value just out of curiosity, you can see that auto value adds a little bit to the performance, but it's not by much. So auto value doesn't, it's, if, if you're looking at auto value for performance, that's not necessarily, uh, uh, you're not gonna have much of a gain there. All right, so now we have um, our, uh, all the information that we need to actually do the migration. So we know that there are advantages to using data class, and we know it can help our project, simplify our project. However, migration at first doesn't, didn't look as trivial, because if we just use the conversion tool from uh, Android Studio, we get an auto value class converted to Kotlin. And then there's quite a tedious process of renaming the fields and the methods um, manually to data class. Uh, which, uh, when we first tried this, turned out to be quite annoying, especially because the Java classes that we had that used those model classes, we needed to rename those manually to prefix them with a get, because uh, from Java, when you access a data class field, we need to call get user name, get age, and so on. So what did we do instead? Well, we wrote an IntelliJ plugin to do this refactor for us. And before we go into the code for that, let's see if we can get a quick demo. Uh, how do I get there? It's... Okay, this is maybe a bit bigger than I expected, but... <laughs> um, so this is a very simplified version of our abstract class. Uh, we are not looking at annotation here, just to simplify this. So here we have just an abstract class, but it looks basically like an auto value class. And here we have its usage, a simple usage in Kotlin, just combines the name uh, with the age and returns uh, a string. And here we have the usage in the same usage in, in Java. Well, it's cutting, but uh, it does the same thing. So it formats and returns user name, uh, then comma age. 
So if you go back to the user class, and then we have the plugin action example convert to data class, hopefully, yes. We get now our data class, our abstract class converted to data class, and in Kotlin, they are now a field, they're not anymore an abstract method being accessed, and in Java, we have the user get name and user get age, which turn out to be, developing this turn out to be simpler than expected, and so the results were quite good, so we were very happy that uh, this uh, worked out and simplified the, the migration process for us. So how does, a, how does this plugin work? Um, the entry point for a plugin, in this case, is an action, right? So the user is tapping uh, on the menu option to make the conversion. So when that happens, we get this call on the action performed event in our plugin. And uh, this is a simple uh, boilerplate code that we can add to um, start the refactoring. So this is a, is, is a simple example. So we look into a simple example here where we first get the current file that is open. Um, and that returns a PSI file. A PSI file is basically uh, an interface that IntelliJ provides for us to navigate through our code in that file. Uh, and once we have access to the file, we can navigate uh, the source code via a tree visitor, um, which then has different methods we can override to visit different elements in our code. So here, for example, every time uh, the um, the visitor encounters a class, it's going to call back on this visit class function. And then what we can do with it is have a write command action where we can write some code uh, or make some replacements or some refactoring and so on in that class. Um, so in our case, we want to convert from abstract class to a data class. Uh, what we do here then is check if it's not a data class, and if it's not, and again, we're simplifying things here, we're not doing all the checks we should, uh, if we are publishing this plugin on IntelliJ. Um, and if it's not, we can add the modifier data keyword to make it a data class. And if it's abstract, we remove, we remove the abstract keyword. Uh, next, we have the visit name function callback, where we can also run commands um, to then change the names of our uh, f uh, methods. So here we have, um, we want to change the users, like the colors, the name of the colors of our, of our methods. Since we are changing, we have an abstract call, a method, for example, named uh, age, and we want to make sure that the Java colors are now changed to get age instead of just age. So here's what's happening here. Uh, we use this reference search dot search to find the user, uh, usages of this function, and then for each uh, user of this function, we call this handle element rename to rename it to get age instead of age. Uh, this works well for Java, but for Kotlin, what we want to do is change the type of call. So we are not anymore calling a method; we are calling a field. So for Java, what, for Kotlin, what we need to do is check the language uh, of the element. So if it's Java, we can do the handle element rename that we're doing. If it's Kotlin, however, we can take advantage that this is an abstract syntax tree, basically, of our code, right? So we can get the parent of the uh, method name that has been called, because the parent represents the name of the method plus its parameters, and replace it with the field name that we are creating in our Kotlin data class. Uh, and that's what we are doing here. So we are getting the, the parent and we're replacing it with this uh, new expression that we are creating based on the name of the parameter we are adding to our data class. And that's basically the gist of it. Um, if you're interested, the source code for this example, the full one that works like uh, I showed before in the demo, uh, is available at this address. If you're, interested, if you're more interested in IntelliJ plugins, here are some more links. Uh, I will publish these slides later so you can, uh, you can access them. One last thing uh, that we did with our data class in our project, because we wanted to keep compatibility with Java, we still had Java classes, we're not migrating everything to Kotlin straight away, so we kept the with 
uh, methods that we had, because in Java you cannot use copy out of the box for one single transformation. In Java you have to transform all the methods if you want to use copy. So it was easier to just keep the width that we had already for our Java classes and wrap copy inside with the information that we wanted to change. And for similarly for the create, we wanted to keep the, uh, the create for the Java users, for the Java callers, so we just annotated them with GVM static so that we could access um, them from, uh, from Java. Um, finally, just a short notice on tests. We had a lot of tests already for parsing our, our classes. And it was very helpful to ensure that everything was working as intended once we finished the transformation. So it helped us ensure the correct serialization and deserialization of our classes. Uh, the it helped ensure that the conversion of the methods were correct. And in some cases, it was good to have Mokito now supporting um, uh, mocking final classes because in Kotlin everything is uh, final by default. And in a few cases we needed that and it was uh, helpful to have Kotlin support it. So in the end, uh, we had uh, these 46 auto-value classes in our project that we converted to Kotlin. These auto-value classes, they were generating uh, these extra classes uh, and these 500 plus uh, methods. We got rid of four dependencies, we added one, the JSON value. Um, because annotation processing uh, was happening less now, we had less plugins, we were not using auto value anymore, our build time improved a lot. Uh, the clean build was more than a minute faster and the uh, incremental builds when changing one of these classes improved a bit, not as much, but still was a significant change. The APK, APK size remained the same because the uh, auto value is, uh, is uh, done at compile time, so we didn't uh, change much on the on the APK other than the additional classes that we didn't have anymore. And because of the mixed serialization approach, uh, the startup time increased a bit, but we were okay with it. We are hoping with, uh, to, to replace JSON with Kotlin X serialization and then measure this again to see how, how it helps. And with that, I thank you. I think I was a bit early. Sorry, I was a bit fast, maybe. <laughs> but any questions? No, no worries. Um, <laughs> first question. Yeah, so you show how to do, uh, how to migrate uh, from auto value to data classes. Yeah. But I'm, I'm working for a library and I'm used to provide some builders to allow them to, to allow my, my clients to use the builder in a, so create the classes in an elegant way. Um, for the data classes in Kotlin, what I have seen is you have to create like a uh, class inside and do everything by your hand. Is, do you know it's, this is, there is another, a better way to do it or that's the you only way that this You mean other than uh, having a builder for your data class? Yeah, so. You could. So the, 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 the way that, as far as you know, the way that Kotlin provides is yeah. you create a class inside your class. For example, this is a, you have the... Like uh, the companion object, you mean? Yeah, you also, all, no, all, all, other than the companion object, you need to create a class inside your, your data class. No, you need to create a class called builder. Okay. I, in this class, yeah. you are putting all the values to make to, to make to make a builder, and you are making the builder by your hand. Um, but in, I I don't know if I get why you need to do that because I mean with data classes you can just call the constructor directly, right? And if you need default val default values, you can just set default uh, it's in the data class field. It's because I have the the, the I also have uh, Java code. It's not migrating okay. only. So. Yeah, but and then then you need to do something like this, right? You need to have some kind of create. Um, function that creates with the defaults or like some kind of, yeah, you need to do a, like a builder like you do in Java. There is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, th th there, is, there is no way. You, you need to do it by hand, a, right? I'm not aware of a way to, to get out of that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Just one question. Um, when you use Moshi to pass the JSON data, you have you can use all the features Kotlin provides, like uh, constructor, default parameters, and so yeah. on. 
Do you also have this with the Kotlin X serialization? Or uh, is it possible to set it up somehow? I believe so. I didn't test Kotlin X for that specifically. Okay. I, we tested this with JSON, and with JSON it doesn't work. Yeah. Because it's uh, actually JSON is using a trick with the unsafe package of Java. So if you're using the default methods, uh, it's going to fail. Unless you annotate all your fields with default, then it works because it becomes a constructor. Or you can do like an extra constructor uh, in your data class to provide it as with the default values. Then it works with JSON, but uh, with Kotlin X, I'm not sure. I would say yes, but uh, it didn't test. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, hey, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, just one question: Why did you haven't you choose Moshi instead of uh, JSON? JSON. Uh, be, because we had we had JSON in the project already with custom adapters in different places, so it would be a bigger change. And we are hoping to migrate to Kotlin X serialization once it becomes more stable, and then we can. So we, I mean, this is a bigger talk. So we are hoping to have a common uh, Kotlin module that we can share between uh, Android and iOS, okay. and we are hoping the K serializer can be part of this solution. And so we didn't want to do a two-step migration, okay. and JSON was already working for us, so we didn't feel the need to migrate to Moshi to then migrate a second time to case serializer. Yeah, yeah, I got so. what you mean about this case serializer. Isn't it in beta still? It's in what, sorry? In beta? I mean, yes, so it's marked as experimental, but I mean, it's already working, and it works already for different use cases. Uh, in January, in February, when we finished this migration, we didn't start adopting it because of the performance. So we had concerns with that. But they were quite fast and responsive to do the work to actually improve it and to make it reach the levels of uh, JSON and Mochi. Okay. And so now we are looking at it again, but uh, probably in another talk. Yeah. <laughs> we okay. may talk, talk about it again.